You can go ahead and have a seat. And if you've got a Bible with you, I want to encourage you to open up to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5 is where we're going to be at. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, we've got Bibles in the chairs around you. We'd love for you to, to grab one of those. If you don't have a Bible at home, please take one of those with you. We'd love for you to, to have God's Word in your home and, and have that as a resource to you. But um, tonight we're continuing on uh, our look at the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, my name is Robert. I'm one of the pastors here. And we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount which is the longest recorded section of Jesus' teaching we have in the New Testament. This is the biggest chunk that we have of, of really understanding what's he, what's he have as a message for us, what is the life he's calling us to, who is he calling us to be. And, and as we've been going, going through this, the, the overarching theme that we have is that Jesus wants to turn our life upside down. And, and oftentimes that has a negative connotation of like, oh, my day got turned upside down, and it's, it's a negative thing. But in this case, it's Jesus saying, hey, you've got your assumptions, your, your uh, biases as a person, but I want to change those. You've got your normal mode of how you operate and what you do, and I want to turn that upside down so that you can be more the person that I created you to be. And, and what I love going through the Sermon on the Mount is that there's a, just an immense scope of what he has to say for us. Jesus touches on a, a number of topics, hitting on our, our life, our character, relationships, and, and our faith with him, and all, the, all this while not avoiding the difficult topics. And that's where we're at tonight, because tonight we're looking at what he has to say about lust and adultery, as, as Pastor Mitch shared just a moment ago. And, and in this, what's interesting is that, that Jesus never sought to avoid the difficult topics. He never said, hey, I'm going to avoid being awkward or taboo in what I talk about. But his goal was to say, hey, what do you guys need to hear so that you can be more the people you were created to be? And so that's where we're at here tonight, and I just want to thank uh, Pastor Chad for scheduling this while he was away so that I got this assignment. <laughs> Must be rough being on a cruise in Barcelona right now, but here we are talking about lust. And it, what's interesting in this, though, is that, that Jesus has a very clear goal in why he brings us up. And it's so that we can be more the people he created us to be and, and, and to, to avoid our life going to a place none of us want it to get to. And so we're going to unpack what he has to say for us tonight. Uh, so Matthew chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 27. Uh, we're actually just going to read 27 and then uh, pause for a second. So uh, Matthew 5, 27 says this. He says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Now we're going to stop right there. Don't, don't fold up your Bibles because we'll come back to the rest of this. But but what I want to do is, is he's in, if you read the whole, the whole stretch of the Sermon on the Mount, he's, this is kind of a section of it where he's going, hey, you've heard this said, but. And he does this a number of times through the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. He's saying, hey, you've heard the Old Testament say this. And he might go back to an Old Testament reference or, or an Old Testament command or a passage or just a, a commonly held uh, teaching and belief. And he says, okay, now let's talk about what that means for us. And so this is the foundation for, for what Jesus Jesus is going to talk about for the rest of this time. He's saying, hey, you've heard it said you shall not commit adultery. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because it's one of the Ten Commandments. It's commandment number seven. So anyone that Jesus would be talking to, they're going to hear that and boom, they've got things going on in their mind. They're like, okay, I know exactly what he's talking about. That's, you know, number, commandment number seven, do not commit adultery. I know what he's saying and stuff. And so he's, he's got that shared understanding there. And, and we do as well. This is something that we're not, we're not sitting here wrestling on whether or not adultery is okay. This is not something where we're like intellectually, I'm not sure if this is acceptable or not. This is something that, that pretty much across a, a vast number of cultures and belief systems, it's understood that it's unacceptable. Uh, but Jesus starts with this as a foundation of saying, hey, you've heard it said you shall not commit adultery. And, and before we dive into what he says on our present day application, I want us to say, hey, why did he give us this command? He says the command here is no adultery. Why did God originally give us this command? And I think the, the first big reason is that it's because God cares about marriage. He God, God cares about marriage mostly because of how we were created. When you look back at the beginning in the book of Genesis when God creates everything. It says that in the very beginning there was nothing and he started piece by piece establishing and forming and creating our world. And he goes through, he says he created the, the heaven, the sun, the moon, the stars, and he pauses. He creates the, the, the land and the sea and he pauses. He creates all these things and he would create and then he'd pause and he would say, it is good. 
And as he goes through, he gets to the point where he creates the first man. He creates Adam, and it's just him by himself. And God pauses, and for the very first time in the existence of our world, God calls something not good. And it was that man was there alone with no relationship, no companion, no community. And so it says, as it continues, that God created Eve. He created a partner for Adam. And then after that was concluded, he again paused and said, it is good. And so from the beginning, we see that part of how we as humanity were created is that we were to be people that exist in relationship and community and fellowship with one another. That's partly why God has established the church, that we would have a a corporate community to be a part of. It's why here at Calvary, we encourage you to be a part of life groups so that you have that that tight-knit community that you're involved in. But we operate in relationships. And for the vast majority of us, our primary relationship is our marriage. And, And God understands that our marriage is, is a key to us operating and how we were created to live. That, that community, that relationship is important to us. But as we look at how God designed marriage, we also have to understand that, that monogamy is God's design for marriage. God being all wise, all knowing, knowing all the options, how everything could possibly pan out, says, hey, I understand the different options and my design for marriage is one man, one woman for one lifetime. And here in 2019, with each passing week, that statement gets more and more controversial. What, what 50 years ago would have been a statement that would have gotten a resounding amen is now a statement that causes all kinds of conflict and division in how God has designed marriage. But understand, that is how he designed it, and that's the foundation that, that he established this for. God cares about marriage because we were created for community, and he understands that we are created for a, a close-knit, monogamous relationship with that. So God gives us the command here because marriage matters to him, but also because he wants to help keep us from pain. God says, hey, don't commit adultery because he knows the pain, the destruction, the damage that can come from that. And I love when, when we went through the Ten Commandments a few months ago as a church, uh, Chad titled that series Guardrails. And, and I love that analogy because in many ways, that is what the Ten Commandments are for us. They're guardrails to help keep our life from crashing. You know, we, when we look at the Ten Commandments, it's not God saying, hey, I'm giving you these commandments because I want to keep you from all the fun, enjoyable, amazing things in life. He's saying, no, I, w- I want to keep you from the places of tragedy and pain and destruction. In the same way that when we're on a windy mountain road, we're not looking at the guardrail saying, man, you're keeping me from enjoying this drive, but we look at it and we go, you're keeping me from from tragedy, from destruction and harm. And so when God says, hey, this is the command, do not commit adultery, it's because he cares about our marriages and he wants to keep our life from, from destruction and pain. So knowing the origin of this, let's go back to Matthew chapter 5. This is the foundation for what his shared experience, his shared understanding with his crowd was. Now let's, let's t- continue this. Matthew chapter 5, he says, You've heard it said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. So here, like many of the other passages in this section, Jesus says, hey, let's take the Old Testament command and let's apply it to our life today. And just like we see in many of the other ones, he, he applies it in a, in a broader spectrum of what it was originally thought to be in. But Jesus says, hey, my application here is no lust. Jesus says, hey, let's take the commandment, do not commit adultery. The application of this is no lust. And as he says this, he's showing us that the life he's calling us to is more than just our outward activities. The life that God calls us to live is more than just our outward actions and behavior. It's about what's on the inside. Because see, the, the Pharisees were constantly in conflict with Jesus because they were experts at checking all the boxes, having all the right outward activities, all the right outward morality and behavior, and yet their hearts were far from God. And that's what Jesus would call out. 
In the same way, we can be people with exemplary morality on the outside and be far from God on the inside. Because it's not just with our life and what we're doing on the outside, but what we believe, how we operate, the things we think on, the things we dwell on on the inside. And so practically, this means that this sermon is no longer about those people who cheat or those people who are perverts. It's about all of us. Because when we back up and we, we really look at lust, we have to understand that lust is us seeking to fulfill a God-given desire in a God-forbidden way. It's us saying, hey, I, I'm wanting to accomplish, to fulfill, to, to meet the desire that God has created within me, but I want to do it outside of the scope of what he has instructed for us. So no matter what that looks like for, for you, lust is, is whenever we're seeking to fulfill that desire that God's given us in a way that's sinful and inappropriate. And so for men, this is, this is commonly a visual issue. And uh, if you've been around Calvary, you've heard uh, Pastor Chad quote his personally fabricated statistic that 95% of mess, men confess to struggling with lust and the other 5% of men confess to struggling with lying. Um, <laughs> And I love that because it points to the fact that because of how us as, as men are wired, we are prone to struggling with this. This is, this is kind of that natural temptation that we're led into. And, and that doesn't mean that we give into it. It doesn't mean that we accept it. In fact, we'll touch on that in a bit with some of the lies that our culture addresses. But, but that means that we have to be more intentional. We have to be more vigilant to fight against that temptation. But if we go back to that definition of lust, that also means that this isn't the sermon where you ladies get to, to smack your husbands on the back of the head with a Bible and go out on your merry way, because this, this is for all of us. This is for each and every one of us. It just looks different for, for ladies. And as I was looking at this, I was kind of thinking about some of the, the, the common cultural polls uh, for women in this area. And I, and I looked up, what was, the, what was the sales numbers for the Fifty Shades uh, book trilogy? As a common, you know, kind of very popular cultural poll, and there were over 150 million copies of that book trilogy sold. Now, to, to put this in perspective, because none of us commonly look at, at book sales numbers, this is more than all of the Chronicles of Narnia books combined. This is more than all of the Hunger Games books combined. This is more than all 14 of the Ian Fleming, James Bond books from the 50s and 60s combined. This is an incredible amount of books. In addition, the, the movie adaptations, while they didn't completely live up to critical expectations, they grossed $1.3 billion at the box office. So ladies, this is, this is something that... that culturally, it's not just a male issue. It's not a, a gender issue because as we look at, at research studies as well, they're showing that the largest growth area for the, the porno, pornography industry is female consumers. And what used to be a male industry, a male problem is now crossing those gender divides and it's an all of us issue. So it's not just guys versus girls that, that Jesus is addressing here. And it's also not young people and old people. See, it's very easy to be like, oh, this is just a young person problem, but a 2018 report showed this. It showed that um, the STD diagnoses rate for those over 60 years of age grew 23% over a three-year span. The overall population in the United States grew at 11% for that same time period. So this isn't a guy or girl issue. This isn't a young or old person issue. This is an all of us issue. Because our culture is, is surrounding us with the message that, that lust is not an issue. Marketers are constantly bombarding us with provocative images to sell whatever they have in front of them, whether it's swimsuits, cheeseburgers, or technology, they're willing to use the imagery that will get our attention to do so. And we're surrounded by lies, lies like it doesn't matter what we look at as long as we don't act on it, lies like if you, if you just keep it to yourself, it's not a big deal, lies like looking never hurt anyone. And when we, when we look at these lies, we see that, that Jesus was, was accurate in his assessment that lust leads us to a dangerous place. And also the, the fact that lust takes us down that rabbit hole of getting to a more serious and dangerous place. 
And for, for the majority of our culture, that place is pornography. And we want to be a church that addresses the, the difficult topics, and, and this is the one that naturally results from us talking about lust because our culture is continuing to perpetuate lies that, that pornography can help your relationship, that it doesn't hurt anyone, that it doesn't affect anything. But Jesus is calling out that. He's saying, hey, lust, no matter what you do, where it is, if it's in the channel or on a computer screen, is wrong. It's, it's of the same severity and danger as physical infidelity. And even secular organizations like Fight the New Drug are, are finding piles of evidence from research studies that show that pornography use rewires our brain in the same way that drug use does. It's where they got their, their name Fight the New Drug because they said it's, it's the same severity of addiction as, as heroin and cocaine. And they're saying that it, it's rewiring our brains so we, we struggle with physical intimacy, we struggle with emotional connection, and it's causing a host of lasting issues in our world. And so Jesus, this is, this is under all of what he's saying when he's addressing this topic. And this is also why he's, he's addressing it so severely, why his suggestions are so harsh. And, and he's warning us of the danger that's in front of all of us. So tonight, I want us to think, what do we do with this? Jesus shows us that we need to, to address this topic, and so I want to talk about taking it seriously. Because when we look at Jesus' suggestions, they're pretty extreme. He says that we should consider gouging out our eye or cutting off our hand if we're struggling with this area of sin. This is extreme. Now, don't go out to the parking lot and do this because he's, he's not actually suggesting this because the reality is that we can still lust with one eye and sin with one hand. Because, because sin is not in our eye or in our hand or on the TV or in our iPhone. The sin is in our heart. And so really what he's saying is you guys need to take seriously what is in your heart, what you are consuming, what are you allowing yourself to dwell on and think on. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 32 also says this when it says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So as we're here today, as we're, we're looking at this, this topic, let me ask you, what are you doing to take this seriously? I'm going to walk through a series of questions that, that kind of addresses us at different stages and, and places of our life, but, but I want us to think, what, what are you doing to take this seriously? Because oftentimes myself, some of the other pastors will sit down with guys who are, are struggling in this area and they'll ask for suggestions and, and really they're just wanting a quick fix and, and wanting to just, you know, have the easy way out of this. And we start to suggest things and say, hey, maybe you need to take this step or do this. And they'll push back and we'll go, don't you think that's a little overboard, a little extreme? And it's like, well, Jesus said that, that we should consider gouging out our eye or cutting off our hand. So maybe it's not extreme enough. But as we go through this, I'm going to have some suggestions. This is not all inclusive. This doesn't match every area of our life, but catch the theme of these and say, how can I apply that area and take this more seriously for myself, for my family, for my friends? Because Jesus wants us to, to take this topic very seriously because he knows the, the possibilities for how this can destroy us. So with that, how do we take this seriously? First, individuals. For you, is, it's individual people. What safeguards and boundaries do you have in place? Because before we get at how, how do we fix what we've already done, we should start with how do I prevent myself from failing? How do I keep myself out of the situations that are going to set me up for failure? And so with that, what, what safeguards, what boundaries, what, what restrictions are you going to personally put on your life to keep yourself from danger? And, and some suggestions with that. If you, if you travel a lot, how do you, how do you safeguard yourself with that? How do you, how do you prevent yourself from, from too much time alone, unsupervised, where you can get into to areas where you shouldn't be? If you travel a lot for work or, or you go out to lunch meetings and stuff, are you cautious with, with spending time alone with the, the opposite sex? Are, are you comfortable with, with car rides with people that aren't your spouse? And if this sounds extreme, Remember what Jesus' suggestions were. Because these, these are us just establishing, hey, what are healthy boundaries between myself and someone of the opposite sex? But for us as, as Havasu residents, what about how we interact with the city around us and, and when do we do that? 
So we've got those holidays that, that happen throughout the year, and we know that there's certain points on the calendar where our, our town morality takes a very steep dive. And next weekend's one of those, Memorial Day weekend, kind of that initial holiday weekend. If you're, if you're a boating person, is that really the weekend you want to take your boat through the channel for the first time this season? Is that really the time where you're like, oh, let's go take a, a walk through Rotary because, you know, it's, it's nice outside? And maybe it's not even that. Maybe it's, hey, are you, are you going to schedule your, your Safeway shopping trip to be on a Friday evening of Memorial Day weekend? See, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we hide away from culture. I'm not suggesting that we never interact with the world around us. I'm just suggesting that we be diligent and we think through the implications of our actions. Even if that means us choosing to withhold from an activity or a time, because if Jesus were here in Lake Havasu, I bet he would suggest that it would be better for us to miss a holiday weekend on the lake than for our whole body to be thrown into hell because we fell into sin. So individuals, what are you doing to, to set up healthy boundaries in your life? Secondly, what are you doing to foster healthy accountability? See, this issue of lust, of pornography, of addiction in this, it's so, it's so powerful, it's so dangerous because it exists oftentimes in secrecy and isolation. And it, and it thrives in that isolation and it's, and it's the very thing that keeps it going. And so how are you going to fight against that by building accountability? And one thing that, that we do, our, our whole pastoral staff here, uh, for all of our devices, we have accountability software on it. So if you pick up any of my devices, my, my iPad, my phone, my computer, any of those things, you'll see in the upper right-hand corner a Covenant Eyes logo. And that's a, a piece of software that constantly monitors every website, every app, every URL I visit on any of those devices. And every week, a handful of people get an email report of that. And that might sound extreme, but it's us saying we don't want to have the temptation to fall into that trap. Because I know that if, that if I do something I shouldn't, that I've got to have a handful of difficult conversations pretty soon thereafter. And so for you, how are you building accountability? Do you have people in your life that are asking you the difficult questions? Do you have some kind of accountability set up with people in your life? Maybe it's even you need to take that step with your technology as well. And if that's the case in your, your sermon notes, you'll see a, a, a link there with some notes of how you can connect with Covenant Eyes uh, because I want that to be something that, that we take seriously. But how are you building in healthy boundaries and healthy accountability in your life in this area? Secondly, couples, how are you fostering a healthy marriage? See, the, the, the reality is that by building a healthy marriage, you are naturally pushing and fighting against this issue of, of temptation. And it might be that your marriage is in a difficult spot. It may be that, that you lack that closeness and intimacy that you need in that relationship. And that may be the place where Satan is, is tempting you the most. And that's the, the on-ramp that he's using. And if that's the case, what are you going to do to build a healthy relationship it might be that you need to pursue counseling. If that's the case, do it. It might be that, that you guys are, aren't quite in a, in a bad spot, but you're not in a great spot either. So maybe it's getting a marriage book and going through that or, or attending a marriage conference or signing up for an online course or do something to continually grow in your relationship. Even something as simple as having a regular date night where you're having conversations that aren't just about the logistics. Of, of where do we go when and who's doing what and what kids have what activity, but saying, hey, who, who are we as people? What are our goals and aspirations for our life, for our marriage? What are you doing to build a healthy relationship with your spouse? Lastly, parents, what are you doing to protect your children? Because the, the reality is that our kids are surrounded by technology and, and the days of going to the library to access the internet are gone. Gone are the days where to get on the internet, you had to shut down the family phone line and dial into the modem. Those days are gone. And an internet now exists in the palm of our hands anywhere we go at any time. And, and a lot of you aren't in the place where you've got little ones at home, but you've got grandkids running around. You've got connections with children that, that you're involved in their life. And the truth is that, that when we 
hand a, a child a device, whether it's a tablet or a phone or a computer, if we're not guiding them through that, if we're not setting up healthy boundaries for them, we're essentially handing them a loaded gun with no training and saying, hey, go have fun, be safe. So when it comes to, to, to our kids, how are we helping them navigate this world? I looked up a, a statistic because it's been a few years since I've, I've gotten it, but in the United States, the average age of initial pornography exposure is now 11 years old which means that this conversation probably needs to be happening sooner than you would want to with kids so that we can help them navigate this world. So if you've got little ones at home and you're, you're navigating this, think carefully, when should they actually get that smartphone? It's okay if they're the last one in the class to get it. It's okay for us to be inconvenienced a little while longer with not having that direct contact with them. If you've got older kids, teenagers that, that already have phones, what boundaries, what restrictions do they have? It's okay to say, no, you can't use that app. No, you can't use those websites. No, you can't have unlimited freedom with your technology. And as a high school pastor, I'm really just destroying my ministry to my teenagers right now, but I don't care um, because this is important. Because if Jesus were in our world today, he would say it's better for your kid to be different socially in the area of technology than for their whole body to be thrown into hell because they fell into sin. So parents, what are you doing to help safeguard your kids, to help them navigate this area of life in a healthy way? Because the world is surrounding us with the message that sin is okay and is constantly trying to sell us on that. See, Jesus wants us to take this seriously, but today as we wrap up, I want to pause and recognize that this might be a difficult topic for some of us to digest today. This might be a sermon that, that for whatever reason is a little bit more difficult for you to, to hear, and it might be that, that you're filled with shame and regret over some past failures and hurts. It might be that you're currently wrestling through some current issues that, that are, are you're facing in your life. But no matter what it is, I want you to hear today that there is grace. Even as Jesus is saying, hey, these are issues that potentially could get your body thrown into hell, he also is the one that made it possible for us to be forgiven. Because as we read through the rest of the book of Matthew, we see that Jesus went to the cross. He was crucified on our behalf. He died on a cross so that we could be forgiven. We could get a clean slate. We could have a fresh start. So today, don't let the shame and regret of past failures keep you from putting your faith in Jesus and moving forward. Because there is grace, there is hope for all of us in this. See, so today, my hope for you is that, that you would hear the, the instructions of Jesus and you would hear it and, and not let it lead you to a place of shame or condemnation, but as a way to get you to a path of life and purpose in Jesus. As we continue through the, the, the Sermon on the Mount and looking at this, I pray that this would help turn your life upside down, that it would revolutionize how you see the world around you, that it would revolutionize your faith in Jesus. Today, I pray that you would hear the words of Jesus and that you would trust and follow him and that your life would be turned upside down. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you just for the difficult messages that, that often happen, that we often encounter as we are faithful to walk through your word. And God, we just thank you that, that you never avoided the difficult topics, that you never avoided the awkward conversations because you care about us and you want us to be people who have healthy, meaningful relationships and have a healthy relationship with you. And God, that's our prayer tonight, that as we look at this topic, as we digest what this means for us, that it would, it would push us to a place where we trust in you more, that we rely on your strength to overcome temptation and trial, that we would ultimately fix our eyes on you. God, let us be people that, that can truly sing it as well because of what your son Jesus has done for us. God, we thank you that, that the cross means that we have forgiveness for our failures I thank you that it means that, that our regret and shame can be put away because of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the debt that he paid on our behalf. It's in Jesus' name we pray.